just wanted to uh, start with the fact that like we're all here today because SEO because SEO is valuable and search traffic is valuable. Um, I know that on our sites, the sites that we manage, that search traffic converts better than any other traffic because search visitors show up and when they show up, they're ready to buy or at least they're researching a purchase decision or initiating a sales conversation or something like that compared to other sources of traffic. But when it comes to SEO strategies, I mean, I've been doing SEO for 20 years here, um, SEO strategies floating around the industry, um, it's really hard to know what to try, what to do. There's tactics online, blogs everywhere, and, and people talking about SEO and claiming that they know the secret. Um, and when it comes to working with our brands, a lot of times we will see results, but we don't know what tactics that we implemented actually delivered the results. So SEO is hard and SEO advice is confusing and contradictory and overwhelming. Um, there's just so much out there. When I dig into the strategies that appear online, I see that some of them are actually out of date and the rest of them just aren't exactly right for the situation that we're dealing with in any given time. So I really feel for marketers who are either, either they're just getting started with SEO or if you're working to pivot your SEO campaigns, um, super hard to know what to do. So when folks come to us, like in our agency for the work that we do, um, a lot of times I can see that look on their face so that I have when I'm in the paint store. So it's like, there's too many choices. You know, what, what should I be doing? Uh, what should I pursue? So I want to tell you guys about a mortgage company that I work with. They were a national mortgage company that you've probably heard of. And um, they came to me and they said, Dale, we're all in on SEO. And critically, these guys had the resources to do it. So it wasn't one of those situations where we're trying to figure out how to deploy limited resources. Um, they pretty much could do whatever they wanted. Um, and they, they were running their campaigns. I mean, they brought me in after they had built out a big team and they had a bunch of campaigns that were un already underway. But after they had a, a little bit of growth in the beginning, um, their growth had really stalled, even though there, there had so many people working on this. When I looked at what they were doing, uh, they were doing a ton and it was super impressive because it was ambitious. Um, they were doing link, like, I'm uh, sorry, 110 blog articles a month, directory submissions, competitor monitoring, ongoing optim page optimization, rank tracking, uh, pretty much everything that you might do if you were uh, interested in putting a lot of resources uh, behind SEO. And they were doing all of the things on this slide. So when I, when I read through all the tactics and campaigns that they were running, it really re looks to me like a top 20 chart, like the top 20 hits of SEO tactics from the last decade. And they chose these tactics because they worked at some point in the last decade and they worked in certain situations, but they didn't really know what was going to work for them. So they did everything. So interestingly, what it comes down to is like, if you're optimizing for a modern AI search engine, some of these tactics are still effective, but some of them are a waste of time nowadays. Um, so back to the mortgage company, what did the team look like that they had put together? So they had an SEO manager who was managing like 10 people that they had on staff. Uh, one was a PR consultant. Um, who was working with top shelf media, getting write-ups, mentions, and backlinks. They had a social media manager who was managing all their social channels. Um, their SEO manager was also managing an SEO analyst, and the analyst was looking for opportunities to optimize individual pages for specific keywords and opportunities that he saw. And then they had a reporting specialist. The reporting specialist was putting together reports for the other folks on the team to use, but even more importantly than that, reports for upper management so that basically so uh, upper management can justify the spend on this effort. They had a content marketer who was responsible for content strategy. So what articles are we writing? And then also partnerships, content partnerships. And they were also working with 20 freelance writers. It's a lot of writers to manage, but each writer was turning out around six or seven pieces of content a month. Um, so decent amount of content there. And they had a link building specialist. So the link builder was responsible for researching link targets and figuring out what their link building strategy was going to be. And then 
that link builder was managing three outreach specialists and these guys were full time cranking out emails. And you may, if you run a website, you may have seen some of these emails, um, people asking for links and that's what they were doing. So then the question is like, what did they get as a return on this huge investment for SEO? Uh, well, initially they saw some growth, but by the time they had brought me in, the growth had stalled. That's why they were looking for outside help. On paper, they were set up for success, but it, it really wasn't working. And here's why. Um, it turns out that their SEO manager was constantly adding new tactics. So they were, they were trying to do a lot, spreading the resources thin, even though they had a lot of resources, they were just doing a ton. And they had no idea where to focus because they had some initial success with their SEO. They saw some growth with, the, with these tactics, but they didn't know where that growth came from. So they didn't know what to double down on going forward. And they were creating too much content. I know it's, it's hard for me to say because I'm, I'm an SEO guy. And usually when I'm working on projects, I'm, I'm looking for more content, the more, the better for sure. But um, in this case, some of their content wasn't even getting indexed by Google. And then there was some other content that was bringing in traffic, but it was top of funnel, you know, fluffy blog post informational traffic that just didn't convert. So what's the point of traffic if it doesn't convert? So the bottom line was their all in approach on SEO just wasn't working because they were trying to do too much. In the end, we were able to turn this project around, but we did it by narrowing the focus. Like we cut all pretty much half the team and we cut most of the SEO projects that they were working on. And eventually over the course of the next year, their organic traffic doubled, which was awesome to see. Um, but it required some painful cuts, as I said. Um, here's some of the stuff that was not moving the needle that we killed. They were no, we, we, we told them to stop doing social media just for SEO. They were managing it for other reasons. They stopped the directory submissions. We told them to stop working on site speed improvements. Their, their, their site was fast enough. And then also Google News Feed updates, it wasn't helping them. And then the ongoing page optimizations, they had done all the low hanging fruit stuff on page. So it wasn't helping them to just keep polishing the pages. And then competitor monitoring, uh, wasn't helping them in the fluffy blog posts that they were just churning out, 110 of them a month. Those were also not helping. So we axed all of this. Instead, what we focused on was targeted content, so the right content for links and also for uh, keyword, uh, keyword targeting, and then link building. We focused on these two things. And it turns out that everything that they were doing that was not in support of targeted content and link building, it was unnecessary because um, it, was, it was actually slowing them down. So why did this focus on only targeted content and link building work so well? Well, I'm gonna show you in a second, uh, quick aside here, my background, what about Dale, who's Dale? Uh, so a little bit about me. So I've spent my entire career working at the intersection of technology and marketing. I, I studied undergrad, um, undergrad, I studied engineering and I studied AI in grad school. In grad school, we were building a search engine, but I realized uh, for uh, career and economic purposes, I was going to do better optimizing for Google rather than trying to compete with Google and it turned out to be a good decision. Um, I built a supercomputer for the NSA. Um, that's a story best told um, over a beer. And I, for the last 12 years, I've been running Fire and Spark. We're a digital marketing agency, uh, but we focus exclusively on organic traffic. So SEO is, is what we do. So to move on with um, SEO here, uh, I want to tell you about another company. It's going to really drive this point home. This is Fire Department Coffee. So they're another company that we worked with. They're a challenger brand in the coffee category. They had ambitious goals for organic traffic. Fire Department Coffee was started by Luke Snyder. And Luke is a special guy. He was a Navy veteran, and he transitioned to civilian life working as a firefighter. Um, he wanted some great tasting coffee that would help him stay alert, but he couldn't find anything on the market. So he decided to create his own. Um, he started by creating something that he called it the fire department blend. And um, his wife had already been roasting coffee at home. So the two of them got together and made it. Um, he started selling it and he's selling it to folks he knew, firefighters and people in the fire services. And he gave the early proceeds from that first product 
to a camp for burn victims, um, mostly working with firefighters and helping out other folks in the fire services. Um, so, and they're still a mission-driven brand today. So Fire Department Coffee has been a phenomenal success, um, driven by organic traffic and, and their SEO campaigns. Three years ago, they did a million dollars in sales and revenue. And this year, they're on track to do $10 million in sales. So that's going to be 10x growth, which is super impressive, um, especially uh, you know, led by organic, which can take some time. Um, even though these numbers are like super impressive, um, what really uh, floored me when I uh, learned it about this brand is that they went from zero to light speed all while their founder and several of their key employees were working full time as firefighters. So Luke, their founder, basically put together a, you know, a, a business that's got this $10 million run rate while he was working full time, working nights, working, uh, working I, I, I was about to say eight, 10 hour shifts, uh, something like that, 12 hour shifts, I believe they were, um, as a firefighter. So they've experienced some pretty steady uh, organic traffic growth. So, um, and, and their sales from organic have really um, risen pretty nicely since they've started. So what was their SEO strategy? And I think what's critical here is that they repurposed the resources that other brands would have spent on technical fixes, things like site, imp site speed improvements or on-page optimizations or uh, web, core web vitals. Um, and they, they took those resources and instead they focused on telling their founder's story. Um, like I said, you know, their founder's got a pretty compelling story. So um, that was the, the way to go for their brand. And um, doing SEO for like a number of different companies, we found that you can, you can do this even if you've got um, less of a story. There are other ways to do it. But they really focused on telling their founder's story and building a community around their brand. When I sat down recently with Matt Flaherty, he's Fire Department Coffee's CMO, what he had to say about their SEO was, he said, the connection with our community is definitely key to our SEO success. Now that floors me a little bit, because like if, if you stop and think about it, he didn't say key to our success was site speed improvements or keeping up with core web vitals or the software tools that we're spending um, four or five figures on, or um, even keyword research. He said that the key to their SEO success was their connection with their community. So why did they focus on telling their founder's story? Because it resonates with consumers. And when you've got a story like that and you're generating content around that story, you're building out partnerships, you've got folks coming to your site, engaging with your site, that's how you're generating the brand signals that Google's looking for. So Google is looking for signals like, um, like backlinks, mentions, engagements, um, uh, reviews, um, positive sentiment online, um, engagement with your pages. So, you know, visitors aren't bouncing. And Google's looking for all of these signals that Fire Department Coffee was able to generate. Um, they were generating this search engine authority by telling their founders story with through their content and then also through their social accounts. Um, one ranking that they like to, to brag about, um, if you type in spirit infused coffee, they show up in the top three results. Uh, they started the spirit infusing coffee trend and they have been doing great when it comes to SEO around terms um, related to spirit infused coffee. I'd like to pivot for a second into a very different type of example. Uh, we work with a number of companies in the manufacturing space. So this, this type of strategy isn't only, um, it doesn't only make sense if you're like consumer facing, but these are B2B manufacturing companies. One of them in particular, what they make is they make a 3D printer. And this is a 3D printer at a pretty high price point that professional engineers would buy. And professional engineers, um, these are professional engineers that work at um, a, a large company, a manufacturing company, or maybe a consumer electronics company where they're doing prototyping or maybe you know, low volume manufacturing or something like that. For these companies, what we were able to, in this company in particular, what we were able to do was to build out a community and content that resonated with a different audience. So the SEO that we were doing actually resonated with hobbyists. 
So the hobbyists in the 3D printing space, they might be building their own 3D printer or writing software for their 3D printer. A lot of them are professional engineers during the day, but they're hobbyists at night. What we found was that that was the community to build around the website to get that engagement and the backlinks and um, content and you know, interview those folks. Um, and those are signals that Google will see to increase the search engine authority of your website. But what it did was it improved the rankings for the keywords that the professional engineers were typing in when they were searching for a metal 3D printer or, or something like that, that they would, you know, one of the high-end machines that um, this company sold that they wanted to rank well for, um, for, the, for the right keywords for those high-end machines. So the reason why I'm telling that the story for the 3D printing example is, you know, not only does this approach work for, you know, consumer and B2B and, you know, manufacturing companies, things like that. But also when you're building out this community and you're trying to find this resonance so that um, Google sees the signals that they're looking for, you don't have to do that in exactly the audience where you're selling. So yes, we want to rank for the right keywords and we want the right people to come to our website when they type those keywords into Google, but those don't need to be the people that we're going after when we're doing our link building or building out a community around our brand or um, doing uh, either a mission-driven approach or a story-driven approach or, or something like that. So the, the key behind this is that um, Google's AI is really nowadays tuned to find brands that resonate with consumers. These are brands that resonate online, that are generating these signals that Google is looking for. So Google used to be a rules-based search engine. And what I mean by that is when Google started, you know, the original paper, the page rank algorithm written by the Google founders, um, it was, they were basically using the backlink structure of the web. So if other websites are linking to you and linking to your pages, your website and those pages are more important and should rank higher than other pages on the web. Uh, nowadays, Google is AI based. So AI and the search algorithm is pretty much a black box. It's a big statistical machine that figures out the probability that this page should rank for this keyword and then ranks everything when you type a keyword into Google. Um, we know that Google's made this shift to AI because we're able to see their patents. We're able to see like the research they're doing and the patents that they're filing. The other thing we know is that they're using people, like real humans, to train their AI. And the important thing here is they're not using people to determine rankings. They're not having a person go to your website and say, oh, they should rank number one. Instead, what they're doing is they're having people look at um, a randomly selected um, set of websites online, and those people are grading the websites and um, for which ones are higher quality than others. And they're using that data set that the humans are creating to train their AI. And then the AI is making the ranking decisions at the end of the day. So this puts us in a spot where we've got this black box AI algorithm that we don't know exactly how it works in terms of what levers we should pull. Like it's not the same as the days where we needed, we, what we would do is put keywords in the keyword meta tag or make sure our, our HTML or sitemaps are perfect. It, it's more that the AI is being trained by people to make decisions the way a person would. And, and that makes sense because um, it's people searching online and people who are deciding whether they um, whether they're, they like the, <laughs> the results that they're given um, as opposed to computers. Um, but there's, fortunately for us, there's kind of like an easy fix for, you know, how do we optimize for like AI search engines? Um, we've come up with, you know, what we call like an authority first approach to SEO. And I'm going to give you guys some more examples. But when we're doing our authority first SEO, it's really a one, two, three process. Um, the magic one, two, three. Um, but first, we're starting out with doing just enough technical SEO that we know Google can see our pages. So we're going to fix pages if they aren't getting indexed at all, or if there's something broken on the site where Google can't crawl or index our pages. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on technical optimizations like site speed, because as long as we're you know, reasonably fast, it's really not going to help us when it comes to rankings. 
And then the second thing that we do is we ensure keyword visibility. So we're doing the keyword research. We're making sure the keywords, the right keywords are on the right page. And we're building out new content as we want to target more keywords. So that makes sense. But finally, in the third step here, and, and this is where we spend the majority of our time, we're focused on authority. Um, authority is how you win the, the SEO game nowadays, and it's really how you become Google's preferred brand in your category. Um, and when it comes to authority, like I said before, that's, that's mostly about backlinks, but also Google's looking at how do people engage with your site and are there reviews and that sort of thing. Well, we call this resonance. It's like, does your brand resonate with somebody in a way that Google can see it? And the reason why we look at SEO this way is because we want to start with campaigns that we know are going to resonate when we're trying to grow our organic traffic, rather than starting with technical fixes and technical optimizations, which used to work, but it's not the right way to optimize for an AI search engine. So how do you know if your website resonates? Um, what it really comes down to is are visitors engaging with your content? So they're not bouncing, they're going deeper into the site. Um, do people return to your website, like repeat visitors? Are people writing reviews? Do people link to your website? Is anybody linking to your website? Um, and then the ultimate would be if you're able to build a community around your brand, because Google will be able to see it. When it comes to the engagement metrics, Google can measure how people are like bouncing and spending time with your site. They're not looking at your Google Analytics. Um, Google is really looking at what people click on on the search results page. And Google's able to figure out um, a lot when it comes to engagement with your site by looking at the search results page. So we know that Google's using over 200 signals to determine rankings. Um, this is information that they've released, but they aren't all equal. So if we're doing SEO, we're not gonna optimize for all 200 and all of a sudden we're number one. And the reason why is because some of these signals that Google's looking at when Google's crawling your website are more powerful than others. So those more powerful signals deter deserve more attention and more of our resources when we're doing SEO. Um, and then the other thing is super important is we know that link building is really the most powerful tactic that we have, full stop, period, end of sentence. And the way that we know it, I mean, number one, from the work that I've done for the last decade and a half on SEO, um, when we're doing link building and we're getting quality links, works every time. Um, especially in competitive spaces. And then also we know from studies that search marketing firms have uh, conducted online that um, link building is really the most powerful tactic. Um, but the thing about link building is it's really hard. Um, so that means that it's often ignored. Like a lot of times when we're doing SEO, we're not focused on link building. Um, we're focused on these technical optimizations because they're easier and they make more sense. And frankly, they're easier for SEO agencies to sell. Um, so it's a lot of the reason why we get stuck there. Um, what I see on projects that I work on is that if you want like a 10 or 20% bump in your organic traffic, focus on things like blogging and on-page optimization and, and these technical fixes. But if you want to double or triple your traffic, you really need to have authority building, mostly link building, as uh, the core of your strategy. So to make that happen, you need a brand that resonates. And I'm going to show you how we can make this work for any brand. Um, you might not be, you might, you might be a manufacturer, like um, one of my manufacturing clients uh, that makes uh, 3D printers, or maybe you make um, steel, uh, but you, you can do it. Um, the, the way we do it, we call it authority first SEO. And authority first SEO is really about... Um, leveraging your brand and the strengths of your brand, whatever that is, you might have a mission. So these are uh, brands that might be buy one, give one, or like fire department coffee, they're giving away a percentage of their proceeds uh, to help injured firefighters and the families of the injured firefighters. That's awesome. But um, most brands don't have that type of mission or that social mission. Another way to do this authority first SEO would really be to leverage your product. So product driven, if you're a service company, it works too. We would call it service driven. Uh, but this is really looking at the strengths of your product. So the, the compelling um, features of your products, or maybe your products are made from sustainable materials, or maybe there's something about your service that makes you unique. That would be the product driven angle to authority first SEO. And I'll, I'll show some examples. And then 
You can also do it in a story driven way. So we've worked with companies that are made in the USA. And if you've got a product made in the USA, there's a story you could tell around that. Um, there's also the fire department coffee story around Luke, where you know he was a, a Navy veteran or, or even just the fact that he's a firefighter working as a full-time firefighter. So that's definitely enough to do uh, like the story-driven type of authority-first SEO. So another example here, um, this is the story-driven approach. We worked with a manufacturing company and what they make is Velcro straps that you use to bind Wi uh, wires together and cables. So imagine you're an electrician or you're installing network cables into a building. You're going to want to strap them together so you don't have a crazy spaghetti mess of cables um, in, in, in your job site there. So the issue that they had is like they're really not focused on marketing and branding. I mean, what they're used to focusing on is efficient manufacturing, high quality manufacturing, and also selling into like, you know, high volume wholesale accounts or, or something like that. Um, what we did when we worked with them is we discovered that one of the founders of this manufacturing company was actually volunteering on weekends at a local technical school and volunteering at the local technical school. Like he was telling me, like, he really enjoys working with young people. And these are uh, young people that want to be electricians. So what we ended up doing was launching a campaign, one page on their website where they're basically recruiting the next generation of electricians. And we were able to find organizations that care, um, that advocate for the trades, or maybe these are organizations or journalists that want to get the word about the word out about these jobs in the trades that are available that young people don't know about, or um, people who are just trying to find opportunities for young people, get them to link to the site, engage with the content. And all of a sudden, we've got a brand and a website that's resonating, and that helped us with um, SEO and helped us with Google. Next example, this is a software vendor and they did product-driven SEO. The interesting thing about them was the product that they were doing their SEO with was actually a face shield, even though they had been a software company before COVID hit. But the probably like the week that COVID became a big thing, um, they had, because they build software um, for manufacturing companies, they had a facility where they could manufacture products. And they decided that immediately, like the week that, mean, that COVID became big, that they were going to manufacture face shields for frontline workers and healthcare workers. So the campaign that we put together was a campaign to protect a million frontline workers. And we were able to reach out to, um, we got links and mentions in media sources, um, local media, also healthcare organizations were linking to it and advocacy groups like um, nursing associations and nursing unions were linking to it because they're all trying to figure out how to get nurses the PPE that they needed during this critical, critical time in March of 2020. So that was a product driven um, SEO example of the um, authority first approach. Then another example of mission driven I love this example because this is an online publisher that is actually an e-commerce site. So it's kind of a head fake, but they do it really well. And it's a great SEO strategy. What the way they make their money is that they sell kits and um, parts to people who want to repair their electronics at home. It might be an iPhone or a toaster or anything that you're working on. And they also sell electronics. So at the end of the day, they're an e-commerce site. That's their business model. But for SEO purposes, and because their founder is really excited about the cause, uh, they decided that they were going to go pretty deep into pr promoting um, the right to repair. And the right to repair is just basically means that electronics companies need to release enough information about their products, like, like the iPhone, that I can repair it at home or I can take it to an independent repair shop. If you've ever been to the Apple store, it stinks. It's not a good experience. And they take your wallet and take everything out of it, um, you know, the, the moment you, you arrive. Um, but what I fix it was, is, has been able to do from an SEO perspective is that because they're so active in the right to repair, they have content and links and engagement with their site. And they rank really well for the keywords 
that people are typing into Google when they're looking for, uh, looking to repair, you know, how to repair your iPhone or how to do it at home, or they're looking for kits or supplies. If I want to replace the glass on my iPhone, um, I need to buy it from somewhere. <laughs> I might buy a, a repair kit. Um, so that's why I called it a head fake because they're an e-commerce site, but if you go to the site, it's all the, there's so much information on there about the right to repair and it's working really well for them. I think this is really the right model. If you're starting an e-commerce site nowadays, like this is the right model because this is how you're going to get noticed unless you have something super compelling about your product or you're really good at PR or you've got a, a backstory that you want to be able to use or a mission, um, but something like that. And that's what this talk is all about. So I've, I've already said this, but you don't need a social mission. Like it doesn't need to be a buy one, give one. Um, we have a client we work with who sells sunglasses and they give prescription glasses to somebody overseas. That's laudable. We love the fact that we can help them and help their cause, but that doesn't need to be the case for a mission driven or, or an authority first SEO approach, but it does need to be authentic. In the example that I gave you with the manufacturing company that sells the Velcro straps, the work that they're doing is real. Like they really, the, the founder, this is something he would be doing even if it didn't help their SEO. Um, basically what we did is we took an interest that the founder, one of the founders of the company had, and we made it part of the brand so that we could leverage it for their marketing and really use it as a powerful SEO asset. So it needs to be authentic and it needs to be compelling to somebody online. We would love for it to be compelling to influencers um, so that we have folks that we can work with for promotion. Um, so the the mission could be something like, you know, the founder's backstory. So um, story driven SEO, something like that. Or like I said before, craftsmanship behind the products or democratizing your industry. We work with a company in the financial space that was making investment investing easier. And that was a great story to tell. Um, or it could be the fact that you're local and you want to you want to you resonate locally. And that's how you're able to drive your SEO um, or making luxury available to the masses. We worked with a brand like that in the jewelry space. So why should your SEO have a mission? Like I've already given so many examples, but it allows you to go beyond the keyword focused content that we're normally creating. Like, yes, we need to make sure, we need to ensure keyword visibility. That's, that's really um, the way that I say it, make sure keywords are on the right pages. What we don't want to do is just crank out these fluffy blog posts with keywords in the title and expect that somehow Google's going to rank them. Um, we want to create content that connects with some audience. And remember, it doesn't have to be the folks that you're selling to. In the 3D printing example that I talked to, we're selling to big manufacturing companies, but the folks that we're writing content for are the hobbyists. So we, it also allows us to partner with like-minded individuals um, for, for our SEO. And then it also allows us to do outreach. And when we're doing like link building outreach. We're not asking for a link because we think we're a cool company and they should too. And we're also not asking them to link to content because the content is awesome. That used to work. But um, now when you do that type of outreach, people ask you for money. Instead, what we're doing when we're doing our link building outreach is we're asking them to support the mission. And that's what works nowadays. And if your mission does good in the world, even better. So what does this mission-driven content look like? Um, one shortcut that I've found is to think about how you can create citable content. And citable content is content that other people online who might be advocating for something similar, like um, we, I talked about advocacy groups that care about getting young people into the trades. We want to create content that they can use to basically drive their mission. So in their day-to-day, -day, they're, they're working with kids or they're promoting their idea that more kids should be signing up for um, careers in the trades. And we want to make content that they can use. That's why I call it citable. When they're doing their advocacy, they're citing our content that we created. So this is content that like-minded individuals will use to advance their cause. And we do a lot of interviews because that's easy for other folks to cite. Um, or if we have proprietary data that we could use or surveys we're able to do, or we might write a position paper or policy paper or just put our opinion out there. But we want to make sure there's somebody out there that will link to it um, 
because it's interesting and useful to them. And when we're doing this mission-driven or authority-first SEO outreach, we're pitching the mission, not our awesome con content, <clears throat> not our product, not our service. And we're making sure that when we're doing our outreach, we're getting things like content partnerships, um, we're getting links, we're getting people we can interview for the citable content, and um, we can also do it for customers. So when you're getting started with this mission-driven SEO, there's, a, there's an easy way, kind of my step one through four. First, choose how you're going to do it based on the values, based on your brand. Um, like I said, every brand has some attribute that we could use, whether it's the story or your product or your service or mission or maybe you're purpose-driven, something like that. But it's got to be authentic. It's got to align with what your brand is about. Then advocate for something. got to stand for something. Maybe it's, you know, more kids should be in the trades or it could be um, how your products are made or how this type of service should be delivered. Then build the citable content. So the type of content that um, will resonate and other folks can link to and connect with like-minded individuals and organizations because that's how you're going to um, generate the, the links and the engagement signals that Google is looking for. So uh, a little more detail here before we wrap up. Um, when we're first getting started in the ramp up phase of one of these projects, we're choosing the mission. And I gave a bunch of examples and, and what that could be. Then we're doing our keyword research because we want to ensure keyword visibility <clears throat> and make sure that we have the right keywords and the right pages on the site. We're thinking about conversion strategies. So when we're targeting bottom of the funnel, purchase intent keywords, we can expect people to come to the site, generate a lead, maybe they buy something that's awesome. But other conversion strategies would be something like uh, retargeting, where we're happy to get people to come to the site with top of the funnel informational content because we're going to cookie them and retarget them later. And that, that works depending on you know, what you're selling or what, what service you're trying to generate leads for. And then the other conversion strategy you want to think about might be email capture. So once again, that allows us to, to profitably target top of the funnel informational keywords as long as we have a call to action that's effective, maybe an email download or a case study or something like that. And then we'll follow up with uh, an email sequence to get them to convert. Then we're thinking about content strategy. What content are we creating to target keywords? And then what content are we creating uh, for link building purposes and to to basically to um, promote and get our our story or um, mission or whatever it is out there. And then we're looking at competitors. So we want to understand why competitors have been successful. Um, not only competitors that are ranking for our keywords, but also other people out there that might be involved in uh, whatever um, our, our mission happens to be. And we're doing partner research. So we we want to know upfront before we get started who we're going to ask for links and who we're going to want to partner with when we're when we're creating content um, because we want to see if if we think we're going to be able to get them to play ball or not. If not, we might need a slightly different strategy. Um, I actually went through this with a client I was talking to today. We were trying to understand if people who run job boards were going to link to a certain type of content around a uh, position that we had chosen and we didn't think it was going to happen like we didn't see any opportunity really so we're we're doing a complete pivot uh, to a different strategy that's why we do that research up front and then uh, we're onboarding our writers like we're going to need content um, for at the very least we're going to need a campaign page if like for the campaign where we were trying to give away um uh, personal pr protective equipment to frontline workers, we're going to at least need a campaign page. Um, so we're going to need some content there. And then when we're in the growth phase of one of these campaigns, we're building the citable content, we're connecting with like-minded individuals and organizations, then we're growing our audience and our visibility, and we're using that to make it easier for us to develop content partnerships. And then we're creating more content, and we just keep going and building out, building out authority because um, that's how we move the needle for SEO. Um, if you're interested in more details, we have some resources and some case studies and tools that we use and some emails that we've written when we're doing this type of outreach. Uh, we have that in our Authority for Strategies resource guide. Um, text authority to 66866 
and we'll send you the guide. So I hope this is helpful. And um, that is it for today. And we're ready for some Q&A. Dale, that was fantastic. Um, I got several questions for you. Yes. So uh, let's talk a little bit because I think this this topic is great. And it's very, very hot. But if you're not a purpose-driven business. Yes. Uh, the question came in from Jonathan, will this work for us and how will it work for us? Yeah, it depends on who us is. So, so um, the, it, it can work, but you have to find the right angle for your brand. So um, do you have any idea, Kenneth, what type of company or, or maybe our, our questioner could send that in? Um, if you're a manufacturing company or a software company, you could imagine that you haven't really been doing consumer focused branding and you may have been, um, you may have grown your company to date just based on the strength of your products um, or your relationships if you're selling through channels. And we've been able, we've had a, you know, 95% success, 95 success rate at finding an angle that we can use to do some type of authority first SEO. Um, we actually have a process that we go through. We call it like an authority discovery session where we ask 20, quite like literally 20 questions um, mm -hmm. around your brand and where your growth is coming from. And then we, we use that to figure out exactly what the, the angle would be for your brand, but it is something different for yeah. every company. Yeah. And he said B2B services company. So uh, it's probably again, we can narrow that down even yeah, farther. Yeah, yeah. Because I run a B2B services company. Exactly, like exactly. I, I'm a marketing agency focused on SEO. And, yeah. you know, in our space, there are a number of things that we can be opinionated on in terms of the way the service is delivered, um, the fact that, you know, SEO is a black box and hiring an SEO person on a 12-month retainer is like, you know, jumping off a cliff and taking a <laughs> taking a leap of faith that they know what they're doing and you're not wasting your money. But there's there's... There's there's a number of angles in there based on your um, your position with your in your industry opinions that you have about trends and and also we we have another approach that we take where um, we're focused on whoever the the bad guy is in your industry the the 800 pound gorilla something like that um, but yeah I mean if we if we and I'm happy to talk about it um, with this with the the questioner. Yeah. But if we were to have a 20 minute conversation, we'd narrow exactly. it down to something. Well, try try to get this one down to about a minute or so, because this one this one we could talk about for for hours. Uh, put your crystal ball hat on. What will SEO look like in five years, or what do you think as far as near to midterm? Yeah, so I'm quite opinionated because um, AI is improving at a much faster rate than most people understand. Um, I studied AI in grad school 22, 23 years ago, if, if I have my math right. And the algorithms I was working on are so different from what there is now. Yeah. And I see five, 10 years out, it's going to just be an order of magnitude uh, more powerful. So if you think about it, Google's trying to surface the right pages. Um, they're trying to surface like what you're looking for and what you want to see. Um, based on Google's understanding of your query. So when Google has that working really, really scary well, and they're kind of close, they're closer than I expected now, um, SEO is really going to be about understanding your customers. Uh, like what I would call customer intimacy. How well do you understand your customers? And are you answering the questions online? Are you creating the right content? Are you creating the information that they need to make a buying decision? And if it's, it's high quality and it really is what your customers are searching for, and it's better than what's available from your competitors, Google will find it and recognize it because their AI is getting that good. Um, imagine like a librarian who understands your industry because they've been in it their entire career. Mm -hmm. And they also have read every single page <laughs> on the web yeah, right. um, that's published in your industry. And they just find the right one. And it's the best one every time, like, you know, five, 10 years, that's where we'll be. So it better be the best one. Great point. Uh, this is fantastic. Again, I'll, I'll uh, flash this up here. In case anybody wants to get in touch with Dale afterwards, make sure to find him. Uh, we'll have access to everything. Dale, this fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for, for closing us out today. You and I will talk offline and uh, want you to go have a, a good and amazing day. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right, buddy.